All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is data applications for megawatt and below. If this is your first time joining us, I wanna welcome you. And if you've been on one of our webinars before, welcome back. Um, today, like I said, is on data applications. So we're gonna talk about targeting solutions for megawatts and below. Some topics that will be covered include key requirements of data applications design, maximizing reliability while balancing cost and scalability concerns, and considerations when applying the concepts of the Uptime Institute tiers in smaller applications. My name is Laura Unger, Industrial Manager here at Generic Power Systems, and I wanna go over a little bit of navigation uh, before we begin. So there's a question box in your GoToWebinar panel on the side of your screen. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and put them in that box. We're gonna answer them during a live Q&A session at the end. Um, we will stay on to answer all, all questions that come in, but if you have to leave um, right when the 30 minutes are up, you can do that as well. Um, there's going to be polls, so when prompted, make sure you go ahead and put your answers in for those polls. Um, we'll collect the responses and read them off. You'll get an exit survey as you leave the webinar. Make sure you fill that out. We appreciate those answers. Um, and then last item I want to mention is the post of an email you'll get tomorrow. Um, this will have a link to request free in-person training. Um, that's a PDSS class that uh, provides continuing education credits to you. And then a recording of this live webinar, as well as a link to join us again in April. And with that, I'd like to kick it off to our presenter for today, Michael Kirchner. Thank you for being here. Oh, well, thank you, Laura. So let's kind of jump right in. And when we look at the data center market and you know, a little history, you know, pre-1990, it was just large computer rooms. Uh, 1990 to 2000, client-server computing kind of kicked in. The And, you know, and the Internet really started to redefine what a data center was. And there was a lot more focus on reliability. And then once we hit 2000 through, like, 2007, you know, the marketplace overall really started to change in terms of, you know, co-location and hosting and really kind of outsourcing a lot of that IT world started to, to take off. Uh, one of the big changes in the data center space that made a lot of uh, these changes happen was what's called virtualization. It's basically separating the software from the machine. And I think it fundamentally changed a lot of the dynamics of you know the data center market and cloud computing really allowing that application to hardware to be much more fluid so that leads us to actually one of our first polling questions all right the question is what data application is driving data center growth go ahead and launch it and you can put your answers in by clicking one of the bubbles um, options are gaming analytics video or commerce. A few more seconds. All right. And it looks like we had a winner with uh, commerce at 37%, analytics came in second at 26%. So, you know, maybe my question's a little unfair because the data I'm gonna show you really has to do with the, the gross amount of data that's flowing across the internet. In my mind, you know, the data center is managing and serving up that data. And the huge, huge consumer uh, of data is video. So video has really become, you know, the quote unquote, the super app that's really driving the explosive uh, move on the data side of things. Uh, to kind of put it in perspective, you know, they're looking at the, you know, traffic numbers up at, you know, three, what is it, 300 exabytes, which is, you know, a million terabytes is one exabyte. It's just the, the order of magnitude that internet video is now driving is really kind of driving some of that explosive growth. So when we talk about data, and data centers, you know, everybody kind of gets drawn in by the hyperscale because they get the big articles and, you know, all the focus is, you know, you know, hyperscale, but there's really only about 600 hyperscale data centers out there. And when you look at a global perspective, 
you know, there is, you know, projected in 2021, 7 million data centers worldwide. Now, some of these are, you know, small enterprise, you know, environments. But once you kind of put in perspective that there's only 600 hyperscale, there's 7 million locations that people say, yeah, we're processing data, this is our data center. It kind of gives you a perspective that there's a lot of activity happening on the medium and small side of things that may not get the attention because it doesn't quite have the same glitz. So when we look and kind of work backwards, if we make some assumptions at about eight kilowatts a rack, 150 watts per square foot, if we look at a 20,000 square foot uh, raised floor area, you know, that's kind of in that, uh, you know, medium, that's on the top end of the medium market right there. We see that, you know, that's about a 3.5 megawatt load. So kind of our focus for this discussion is really discussing that four mega, megawatt and below market, or if you want to correlate it to raised floor, that 20,000 square foot of raised floor and below. So also, you know, when you look at this little pie chart, the small and medium sized data centers make up 49% of that total market. So, you know, when we start to look at applications, um, there's a lot of interest in terms of what, how do we design backup power for these smaller applications? So, you know, some of the components that go into the data center design, obviously the UPS, which is, you know, conditioning power for the server racks. Um, just to give you some idea of sizes, now this is a, a little bit dated. I, I know the manufacturers are constantly upgrading um, and growing the modules, but basically, you know, Liebert and Powerware, you know, in terms of their approaches are typically kicking around that 1100 um, KVA sort of module size. Then the UPSs are feeding a PDU, and the PDU a lot of times has a step-down transformer in, and that they'll distribute at 480, and then step it down to 12208, so you get 120 volts for all of the servers. And basically, you know, and for some of you, there's monitoring in the PDU. Um, it's an oversized power strip, in essence. It takes the power brings it down and gives us the places that we can now start connecting all the 120 volt load. Uh, static switches play a role in data center design, allows hot swap from one bus to another. It's a way of cross powering things within a data environment, gives a quarter cycle uh, move between one source to another. So that can play a role in data center design as well. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about some reliability concepts. The term reliability is kind of a catch-all term, you know, kind of impacts durability, quality, availability, kind of all put together. A lot of times we use the word reliability in the generator space to talk about occurrences. So if I tell the generator to start 100 times and it starts 99, we say it's 99% reliable. Uh, the data market likes to talk a lot about availability. What's interesting about the word availability is it doesn't tell you the number of outages or occurrences. It just gives you the combined effect between time of the outage and the number of outages. So availability is an interesting number, but it actually is kind of hiding two different numbers. The duration of the outage and the number of the outages. So if we assume a given set of topology, if we uh, you know, assume a, a certain configuration, this is a very simple one. It's a transfer switch, single generator, single UPS module. You're gonna get a certain reliability, a certain availability for a given topology. If you want more reliability, you need a more sophisticated topology. So enter the idea of N or needs. So when we look at it from a basic standpoint, one of the first concepts that comes in is bring in spare components, bring in a, a spare power module for your UPS, 
So you got an N plus one configuration. Something could go wrong and we still have extra capacity. We use this concept a lot in parallel generation. We have a spare generator or two, and as a result, one can go down and we can continue to power the load. So it's kind of a component. So we can lose one component and we can still continue to operate. The concept of 2N is different. 2N refers to two systems or two power paths. So it's not spare components. It's really redundancy of power path. So a 2N approach gives two complete different paths for the power to flow from, let's say the source to the loads and the components in that power path may have some redundancy. So we may have N plus one redundancy in the power pass. So the other key component to kind of put this discussion together is to understand that most of the servers we're coming in contact today are have a dual core capability. So the server itself has a hot swap that happens internally. It'll switch from one power source to the other power source because it has two plugs and it'll arbitrate between those two power sources. So that becomes a key component in understanding and positioning how this is all gonna come together to produce a reliable outcome. So let's start with some generator UPS data center sort of configurations. This would be a very low end solution so when I'm looking at this solution, I have some generators on a common bus. It's an N plus one generator scheme. So there's some redundancy for the mechanical load, the chilling, and there's some redundancy for the UPS load. In this configuration, the UPS modules themselves are redundant, meaning one module could go down and we could still power the loads. The real weakness of this design that we're looking at right here is the loads, the servers are only single corded. So at the end of the day, the server itself has only got one power supply. It's flowing through one PDU. So there's some single point failures that can now happen at the bottom end of this configuration. So to enhance that configuration, a lot of data is designed around the 2N concept. So the generators, can form a 2N configuration in which the generators themselves will provide power to each bus. So they're separated. So we have the generators on the left powering the bus on the left, the generators on the right powering the bus on the right. This particular configuration, they're just showing two for capacity, but there's no redundancy in that, in that they need both of those generators on each of those buses. The UPSs aren't in an N plus one configuration. They need all their capacity. And then as you come down, the servers here are still kind of in a single cord configuration. But what this diagram shows is now a static switch has been added to allow the power to be brought from one bus over to the other via the static switch. So it's kind of a two N approach but at the end of the day, it was still feeding some single cord servers. What we think is kind of a, a good basic design for the smaller data environments is something that looks like this. You look at your UPSs and you drop your UPSs in and you create a 2N architecture around your UPSs and you feed your PDUs and then you have your dual core uh, servers, one off of one PDU and one off of another. But when you look at cost of componentry, the problem with dropping the generators in, in a 2N configuration is you strand so much generator capacity. And generators actually make power, so they're a fairly costly component in the system. So if I put the generators in in a 2N configuration, that means the generators can't ever really be loaded more than 50% because if one bus goes down, I can't switch over to the other bus. And it strands a lot of generator capacity. By coming back and putting the generators in an N plus one redundancy, we strand much less capacity. 
especially as we start increasing that generator count to four or five, we can now provide that redundancy with much less available capacity. And if we do it right, we'll be N plus one of peak design load, but maybe N plus two of typical load. So by doing that, we're actually enhancing some of the total system reliability by getting to an N plus two of typical load and an N plus one of peak design. So this is a concept, the layout here that we think fits with a lot of data applications, which leads us to a polling question. Our second polling question is for maximum reliability, design a data center to use, go ahead and launch it there, dual corded servers, N plus one, gen and UPS, and then 2N, Gen, and UPS. Go ahead and put your answers in. I'll give you a few more seconds. All right, and it looks like most of you chose 2N. Yeah, so I think, again, maybe a slightly misleading question. I think when we think 2N Gen and 2N UPS, I agree, very highly reliable architecture. However, I think you're naturally assuming dual cord servers. You're saying, well, why would I do that and not have dual cord servers? If you don't have dual cord servers, all of that infrastructure doesn't do you much good. So at the end of the day, when you start really looking at reliability, and you start looking at mean time between failure, what really starts to jump across at you is you have to start with dual corded product. If you've not got dual corded product, you can do whatever you want to the architecture and you're not impacting it a lot. You need that architecture to be built from ground up. So you need that dual cord approach to get the advantages of what is above you. You know, kind of illustrating here, you know, the 2N approach, we kind of focus so much on the 2N approach. So here's a table of theoretical probabilities of failure based on, you know, every each of these components having predefined reliabilities. Uh, and as you go down this list and you start taking a look at um, the reliabilities of that, the, the first grade inbox, you can see at N plus one gen and N plus two gens, you're seeing some incredibly low probability of failure numbers, okay? But you're getting the benefit of dual cord and the benefit of dual utility feeds, and you're taking all of those other benefits into account. As you look at some of these other arrowed points, you can see you can have a 2N architecture where you're 2N on the UPS and 2N on the generator and even have dual corded product, but maybe only have one utility feed and your reliability starts to suffer. So what I'm trying to point out here is the discussion to reliability on the generators isn't as, as simple as are my, gener are my generators in a 2N or an N plus one configuration. There are multiple factors that lay together and you can still have extremely reliable power solutions in an N plus one configuration for generators if you're doing a lot of other things right. That leads us to our last polling question. All right, and the question is, what redundancy strategy is the most common for, customer, for customers' primary data centers? Go ahead and launch it. Options are N, N plus one, N plus two, and two N. Let's see what you think. A few more seconds. All right. And it looks like most of you chose N plus one, 61% of you. So this actually, um, you're correct. I got some data here that I've discovered and kind of did a little data mining. Uh, my first gut reaction was, well, it's the answer is going to be a 2N. But, you know, I think that's true for your, 
your larger your your large and 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 larger data centers but as we take a look at the total population and you bring in the medium and the smaller applications you start to find that n plus one is the most common lever that's being uh, used now 2n isn't all that far behind on the power path it is quite a bit farther behind on the cooling side uh, the cooling side is dominated by an n plus one approach on the electrical side you know n plus one still dominates uh, but so even though you know we kind of tend to think of data as a two-end architecture dual corded product um, the amount and the dominance of n plus one is is quite substantial so that kind of leads me to a little bit of a discussion about the Uptime Institute and the concept of, of tiers. So the Uptime Institute, and there's, there's two organizations that use this terminology called tiers, uh, TIA, Telecommunications Industry Association, and Uptime Institute. Uh, they were aligned for a number of years and then they kind of broke apart. I think most people use the Uptime Institute of Tiers, so I just want to start off by saying there are two different definitions in the market, so you may always want to clarify which definition you're using. So basically when we look at the tiers, tier one, two, three, and four, really in the tier one and tier two categories, we're providing primarily just one power bus. There's one path for power to flow to the loads. There may be some redundancy on some of the elements. In tier two, we move into the N plus one configuration. Um, as we move to tier three, we create an alternative power path, and tier four creates two simultaneously active paths. Um, the one big difference that hits us on the generator side is this idea of concurrently maintainable, which hits tier three and tier four definitions. So we wanna look at that a little closer. So here's tier one and tier two. So the tier one, it has one power path, where tier two has one power path, but some component redundancy. You're in N plus one in the UPS here. So we're simply showing a single power path for a, a tier one or a tier two configuration. As we move to tier three, we pick up some added requirements. So everything is maintainable while powering the IT equipment. Uh, human intervention is allowed to bypass for servicing. All equipment must be dual cord. What's not in this definition, but I'm gonna explore on the following slide is, what power source am I operating on while I'm doing this service? Is it the utility power or is it the generator power? And we're gonna clarify that on the coming slide because it kind of impacts the concept of N plus one and the generators relative to, am I gonna call myself a tier two or a tier three design? relative to the Uptime Institute's definitional bracketing. Uh, tier four adds requirements for two active paths and some compartmentalization, which some people read to mean UL 1558 metal clad gear. Um, so there it brings in some additional requirements. So here's a tier three versus a tier four. We're basically looking at, you know, both have the ability to bypass power to the computer loads. They both, there's two PDUs down there with each having the option for a power path. The difference is the tier four makes that an active path all the time, basically drops a UPS on that power path. So the thing that kind of impacts the generator space as we go through these discussions a little bit is the Uptime Institute's definition for tier three and tier four, saying the engine generator system along with its power paths and other supporting elements shall meet the concurrent maintainability and or fault tolerant performance confirms test while carrying the site on engine generator power. Basically the Uptime Institute's philosophy is the utility is the source of economic benefit, but not the reliability source. 
that the generators are deemed the only reliable source. And with that in play, it becomes difficult to implement strategies where you use N plus one generators and still say, hey, I'm a tier three design. Uh, because the bus work that the generators parallel on can't be maintained while I'm powering that bus. So looking at a couple thoughts, couple architectures. One is if you use an N plus one configuration in a 2N architecture, you will get enhanced reliability. We have a product called Gemini where we actually pack two 500s in a, in a box. And in this particular case, I'm showing two of our Geminis for two megawatts on each power bus but each one has some inherent redundancy. If I could lose a generator and you still have 1500 kilowatts coming into that power bus. This is still a fairly a costly approach to hitting that target in that you're stranding a lot of capacity. You're in a true 2N architecture for generators. In this particular strategy, we're moving more to an N plus one, N plus two, probably even an N plus three, given typical loads. In this particular structure, you're using parallel generation, but they're feeding two different buses, giving you the option to isolate one bus from the other. Uh, probably not your first go for a smaller application, but it's something to, you know, to kick around your thought process and say, what if, if I'm doing all my paralleling at the generators, if we're using an inter integrated paralleling strategy, could I simply put two output, uh, two output breakers after the generator and just use them for isolation? Could I isolate from one bus to the other? Basically opening up concurrently maintainable. Um, when we look at traditional 2N architectures, there's usually a desire to have a swing unit because everybody's going to get very nervous when one generator doesn't start and now that bus goes dead and now all the servers have to pull power from another bus, making the other bus mission critical. So in a true 2N architecture, a lot of times you're looking to add a swing unit. You're gonna share it among a number of power paths such that you can bring in that unit if one of the generators fails to operate. Um, the Uptime Institute has also voiced concern about generator ratings a number of years ago. And they basically came up with the idea of, we don't like, that the generators are using their standby ratings. Uh, they felt that that rating was too restrictive and they felt the generators needed a continuous rating. As an industry, the manufacturers kind of said, well, wait a minute, continuous ratings are what we previously used when we were taking our engines and generators and base loading against the grid with a continuous power output. That's not the application we're doing in a data environment. So the industry basically said, hey, wait a minute, we'll come up with some data center continuous ratings. Uh, different manufacturers call them different things, mission critical, data center continuous, uh, uh, mission critical standby. At the end of the day, these uh, various manufacturers came up with different ways to meet that requirement. So. I guess I want to just summarize a, a key idea. I tried to share just some ideas with you all. Uh, my first closing point is reliability is a lot more involved than if my generators are in a 2N or an N plus one configuration. The reliability is a function of your total infrastructure and you can achieve extremely reliable solutions while still putting your generators in an N plus one configuration. And I'm talking N plus one of peak and probably N plus two of typical. As soon as we can get to an N plus two of typical load by using integrated paralleling concepts, 
what you're able to do is offer your customers extremely reliable solutions that don't have all the stranded infrastructure that a true 2N architecture has. Now, at the end of the day, is it classically an Uptime Institute, um, Uptime Institute certifiable uh, tier three or tier four? Probably doesn't meet the concurrently maintainable requirement. So it depends how the customer is going to market. If the customer is saying, I'm going to market tier three sort of availability, but I'm not certifying myself as independently certified, they may say, I'm fine with that. We're not all that worried about maintaining um, the generator bus while on generator power. So it really comes down to a philosophical discussion between your end users, yourselves, and really the expenditure that's going into the project. We're seeing that there is a definite layer within the market. I kind of call it the four meg and below layer where customers are looking for maximum reliability at a value. And how do you achieve that maximum reliability and still provide value for what you're looking at? That impacts a lot of the enterprise customers for on-site enterprise. And it also impacts, I think, a lot of the small colos that are trying to bootstrap their way up. So just take that as some food for thought. Uh, I tried to present some just some data that you know kind of summarizes the market overall some of the components and maybe just get you thinking about how do i want to attack a given application and with that i'm going to turn it over to laura all right i know we're about two minutes over here if you have any questions you can go ahead and put them in that question box we'll say on to answer um, for those of you who do need to leave uh, again, please answer that exit survey as you are exiting go to webinar. Um, we will send you a recording link of this live webinar, a link to request your free in-person PDSS class, and also a link to join us again in April for generator controls, um, application fit, code compliance, and reliability. Um, we hope you enjoyed us today. Um, if you have any questions, you can always send them to indweb at generac.com and we'll make sure to get those answered for you. And Mike, you must have done a really good job. Oh, one question just came in here. Is there a step-by-step -step guide to specify the generator and number of them for data setters? I, I wouldn't say that there's a step-by-step -step guide. I think what you're looking to do is get you know a really good handle on um, how much, what's your peak design load? You know, where do you want this to go as far as your, your initial design? Do you need to plan for any scalability of the generator bus? You know, is there some future growth that you're looking at? Uh, and where do you expect your typical load to be? I mean, there is usually a pretty good spread between, you know, the peak design philosophy and what you're actually pulling on a you know a day in day out basis you know from a backup standpoint i always believe you want to size your modules your your generator modules such that you can achieve n plus one of peak and ideally you'd like to pick up n plus two of typical i think that creates a very hardened environment from an n plus uh, sort of uh, philosophy the smaller the modules the easier it is to pick up n plus two with without capacity. Um, what we see is there's a natural sweet spot in the market around five, 600 KW. That's why we put two 500s in one box because we're really leveraging the natural value that the market creates around the five, 600 KW uh, generator node. So anytime we're using those as a building block, we create some good economies of scale for our customers. Right, and one more question here. Do you recommend limiting generators to 90% of max capacity as sort of a red line capacity? You know, I I think it's fair to say limit designs to about 90%. Yes, the generators can pull up to 100%. They're fully capable of going there. Uh, but from a design standpoint, um, you 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 would say from a peak standpoint, leave yourself 10% reserve. Now, that's not 
90 percent that's not based on typical load that would be based on peak load so you want to make sure you can cover your peak load with a little bit of headroom you you want to leave there a little space i would say ideally your average load when you look at the average load of the generator system you don't want the average load to be much over 80 percent all right and then another one here have you come across a full ring bus data center uh full ring bus it, it's not something that i'm personally um, knowledgeable on all right and then how do you size generators relative to ups size um so when you're looking at the ups generator matchup uh, a couple of factors come into play. Uh, one factor is the recharge rate of the UPS, and the other is um, how generator friendly the technology of the UPS is. So over the years, the technology on the UPSs have migrated. It used to be uh, they were SCR based front ends, and then they'd add filters to them to keep the harmonics down on a generator. Without the filter package and with the older SCR front ends, the generator needed to be quite large to handle the harmonics. So as the filters came in and as current technology now has moved largely to IGBT front ends, the harmonics are largely controlled. So we're not dealing with harmonic issues. Um, the other key is what's my battery recharge rate and my efficiency of my UPS. So you want to be able to handle all the loads, cover the inefficiency of the UPS, and cover your battery recharge rate. Most UPSs have an input that says on generator power. Always use that. The UPSs have ways of operating, different manufacturers of different operating modes that will potentially put that UPS in a mode that isn't all that generator friendly, whether that's active power factor control, or whether that's uh, trying to squeeze out extra efficiency by running on a bypass instead of running through the double conversion process. Whatever it is, if the UPS has an input that says on generator power, always hook that up. And potentially you can head off some problems before they occur. All right, Mike, thank you for your answers. Thank you for presenting today and thank you for being here. Um, everyone on the line, I wanna thank you for joining us. Um, Again, if you have any questions, you can email them to the indwebatgenerate.com and we'll make sure to get those answered for you. Um, have a wonderful rest of your day.